Agape Diem. Seize the day. When I learned the meaning of this Latin phrase, I was just 12 years old. It is from one of my favorite movies, Dead Poet Society, a movie that I watch almost every year, like a ritual. I must say, it is Robin Williams' rendition to the field of education. Picture this. The scene begins with a group of well-dressed young boys rushing into the classroom, some throwing paper balls at each other, some chatting, you know how boys are, unruly. Suddenly, an interesting man walks into the classroom from a room within, walks past the boys whistling, and walks out of the classroom, very peculiar. The boys look bewildered. Then, unexpectedly, the man peeks back into the classroom, calling the boys. Why? Come on. And the curious lot follow him. He, take them, uh, he takes them to a corridor where there are cases of sports trophies and old photographs. Then he speaks. Oh, captain, my captain. Who knows where that comes from? He asks the class. For which the only answer is a boy blaring his nose with a handkerchief. Not a clue? It's a poem by Walt Whitman about Mr. Abraham Lincoln. Now, you can call me Mr. Keating, or if you are slightly more daring, oh captain, my captain. He shows the photographs of the past pupils and then says this. You see, gentlemen, these boys are now fertilizing daffodils. But if you listen carefully, if you listen real close, you will hear them whisper their legacy to you. And he asks the boys to listen. He says, hear it? And he whispers, carpe, carpe diem. Seize the day, boys. Make your lives extraordinary. From that moment onwards, you start watching the story of a teacher who defies the very, defies every conventional ways of teaching, daring the 20th century audience to think out of box. Sometimes I wonder whether he kicked the damn box and set free the whole concept of thinking. He stands upon his desk during his lesson and questions the boys why he is doing so. Then John Keating proclaims, I stand upon my desk to remind myself that we must look at things in a different way. We must constantly look at things in a different way. He has the boys stand on the desk, one at a time. Why? To look at things from a different perspective. He has them walk in a circle to understand how easily they fall in step with each other, which is emblematic of exactly what the rest of the authoritative figures in their lives want them to do. And Keating even has them tear the introduction out of their poetry book because it is very clinical in the way it rates a poem. Dead Poet Society is an outstanding film that demonstrates how education may extend beyond what is taught in textbooks if you have the guts to question the failing methodologies. It is about a professor who defies the norm of conventional and militant pedagogies imparting with lessons about life and literature, encouraging them not to look at things from a single narrow point of view, inspiring 17-year-old young men to find the true meaning of life through literature. Go beyond the books, the walls of the classrooms and school, and find your authentic voice and expression. Let 
me now tell you why Keating asks his students to call him Captain. Keating is more than a teacher to them. He becomes a leader, a mentor, an empathetic and understanding parental figure, and eventually a friend, a captain, a captain of a ship, and the cargo is the future generation. The fictitious John Keating left a Harry Potterish scar in the little me, and subconsciously, I felt a deep connection with this divine teacher, a paradox to uh, the connection of Harry Potter and Voldemort. Keating's passion for literature and the way he influenced the young boys to dare to dream and to seize the day always fascinated me. In me was a dream. I wanted to be the teacher who would one day stand upon the desk to remind myself that I must constantly look at things in a different way and help my students to do so. I wanted to be a captain to my students. I wanted to be a John Keating. John Keating, in that 1989 movie, even before the world became aware of the importance of it all, insisted on the boys to think critically and creatively. We now tend to call them the 20th century, 21st century learning skills. These essential skills, I staunchly believe, should be nurtured at a very young age. What does it mean to think critically and creatively? The American philosopher, psychologist, and educator, John Dewey, defined critical thinking as a continuous and careful consideration of belief on form or form of knowledge. It involves actively subjecting ideas to critical scrutiny rather than passively accepting them. According to Amy Morin, a psychotherapist and the author of 13 Things Mentally Strong Parents Don't Do, says critical thinking can involve taking a complex problem, diving down to the root of it, and developing clear solutions for it. I would like to focus on the importance of questioning, which is an integral tool in critical and creative thinking. And we should never under underestimate the power of questions. It is where curiosity is given birth to and curiosity never kills the cat. That is very wrong. Curiosity will lead to discoveries and answers, make us understand limitations. In the birth of curiosity, critical thinking is woken up, and eventually creativity is watered and nurtured. And then we are in the making of visionaries. A critical thinker will not accept whatever that is poured into the glass of his or her mind, but will question to, uh, and will ask questions to reason with the concept or claim that is put forward. They would think twice, three times, or maybe more before they even say, yes, I agree with you. They will analyze and reason uh, and look for alternatives. This will lead to think creatively, because asking questions will lead the thinker to find creative answer or more. Imagine instilling this amazing skill in a child at a very young age, like five. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure none of you are stranger to the ever scaring questions that we don't like, uh, you know, the questions that our children ask. When the child is ready to throw these questions at us, we are ready to protect ourselves with shields and whatnot. It is a war between you and your child when they attack you with the infamous how and why. When they wear us off with, why this mama? 
Why that, Dada? How come? Can you please explain? How is it possible? We always shut them down with a ready-made answer. Darling, that is how it is. Now go watch your favorite cartoon, right? And it is even worse in the classroom. You ask the teacher, you challenge the teacher, and the teacher does not usually encourage you to do so. And eventually the child gives in. Mr. Keating broke this. The immortal Mr. Keating stands upon his desk to remind that we all must look at things in a different way, especially when you're a teacher. What should we do instead so? I'll tell you a very relatable scenario. My little daughter is a curious little girl. I think she carries a baggage of questions and always attacks me like a well-trained sniper. Never misses me. I always get hit by her out of the box. Was even there a box? Where did she even find them kind of question? But trust me, as tiresome as it might be at the beginning, and uh, you know, uh, at times to answer a never-ending onslaught of questions, it is critical that you encourage your child to do so. Asking questions is the foundation to critical thinking. And the times you spend answering your child's inquiries or working together to uncover the answers will pay off in the end. When my daughter asks, isn't Billy Wonka quite scary? I could have said, no, darling, he's not. The children were very, very naughty. And they behaved badly and paid the price for it. Oh, I can always have the easy way out and say, yes, darling, he is, right? But instead, I can also start thinking with her and make this question of hers thicker. I can answer this question with another question. What made you think so? Why do you think he is scared? Questions like this will lead to another and then to another leading to a very meaningful conversation. Critical thinking therefore encourages you to consider more than one perspective. Let me digress a bit and tell you a story. Once upon a time, there were three blind men and an elephant. So three blind men meet an elephant and since they cannot see, they explore the elephant by touching it, using their sense of touch. They touch different parts of the elephant and come to conclusion using their limited knowledge and experience. So one thinks that it has like a thin wire-like thing which ends with um, a big tail, maybe, I don't know. They're all valid, you see. Okay, I'm sorry. They're all valid, I agree, but they're also incomplete. Now, this is an interesting example of multiple perspectives and the importance of it. Using appropriate questions generates powerful and sometimes many responses and debates. Aristotle stated, that he asked questions in reaction to other people's points of view. And Socrates concentrated on disciplined inquiry in order to discover the truth. Either way, both question. The questions posed by a teacher might be far more important and beneficial than the information and notes they'd share with their students. Such questions elicit thinking which leads to a fiercely self-directed search for answers. Let me talk about a crisis. Reading is a dying habit. And in today's world, that is driven by uh, fast facts, you call it, I think. Obsessed with speed reading. Someone spoke about it. Right? Speed walking. One might wonder, what can you achieve by reading stories? I have been asked this question too. Some have made fun of the fact that I have a huge collection of books, 
and what could the use be? I have heard parents complaining about their children hiding away in the washroom with a book when the exams are around the corner. Being a teacher and a student of literature has taught me that critical thinking and literature are a delightful pair. When the knot is tied, there'd be resurgence and revivals. They thrive in the presence of each other. Some have made fun. Literature is ever so vital now than before because the earth is begging for thinkers. Keating says, you must strive to find your own voice because the longer you wait to begin, the less likely you are to find it all. Literature is not a subject for me. It is a discipline. And in its core, it's all about questioning and analyzing. Reading and reading critically is going to nurture thinking and critical thinking. Education in its true sense is not about passing on facts, memorizing and repeating information. Education should cultivate critical thinking and develop a sense of appreciation of the world around us. Education should make us question things, question everything. Shakespeare, a man who wrote in the 1400s, is still very much alive in the stories he wrote, and those stories are relatable to the audience of 2020. You read a story of Shakespeare, you'll see similarities in the society today. When I assess the character of Iago, for example, the ultimate villain according to many, many critics, I see a man who is driven by anxiety, anger, and hurt, and eventually ends up destroying himself and everyone around him. Now, this is an archetype. Everybody can relate to it. Do not we see such truths amongst us? Studying the play while digging deep into the concepts and themes, understanding the characters, and applying prior knowledge while assessing the issue in multiple perspectives will expand the horizons for the learner while stimulating learning and making the whole experience of learning enriching. Who wouldn't want that? So teaching was neither limited to the four walls of a classroom or to the pages of a book to me. And I am blessed with this burden the burden that I carry so fondly, the burden of teaching kids how to think and how to express themselves critically and creatively. 15 years of teaching has taught me that much. Every child is capable. Every child is capable. I just have to believe in their capacity and accept the diversity. Show the path. Create a love for reading. Urge the child to question everything and to read between lines. Let our children kick the damn box away by keating them and set thinking free. Sasindi Chandra Sekara, one of my students, sent me this. And I'd like to share it with you. In a discussion with her, I was talking about how difficult you know, about Captain. I used to call her Forrest. She used to call me Captain. When I left school, she had sent me this letter. Let me then kindly batter the truth into your thick skull, the mighty blessing of being a Captain. The most terrifying thing that I know about you, your most prized secret, that you've attempted to hide from everyone so long, perhaps as a test for only the cleverest to pick out like me, she calls herself cleverest, is that you are in fact a captain. It is a humble title held by a fraction of the homo sapiens that inhabit this planet. I sometimes think it is more than a title. It is a recognition of being that only the most courageous, fragile, and mad souls can possess, an element embedded in the blood of the most critically insane. I cried when I read. It's because it made me realize and understand the critical role 
that I played as a captain in the lives of my children, my students. I'm yet to learn more and to grow too. I'd like to repeat John Keating one last time. Let us all stand upon the desks and remind ourselves that we must constantly look at things in a different way to our future. Carpe diem.